If you're over the age of 20, then you probably know this ad. That's right, the original MacBook Air was a groundbreaking device. When Steve Jobs unveiled it on stage by pulling it out of a manila envelope, the world kind of went ballistic. We're talking about January of 2008 here. This was a time when netbooks were all the rage. This is before the concept of the Ultrabook, the thin and light, the portable laptop was really a thing. And so, what most of the industry was doing at that point was miniaturizing normal PCs. That meant miniature keyboards, miniature displays, and miniature processors. Too much compromising on less than a full-size display, less than a full-size keyboard, and we think you could put even more performance in one of these products. The MacBook Air promised to be the solution to all of those problems. But there was a problem. Uh, it, it sucked. Really? The story of the first generation MacBook Air really is quite interesting, but first I do have to thank today's video sponsor, Case Coup. You can kind of think of the Magic Stand case as two for the price of one. You're getting a case with military grade drop protection and MagSafe compatibility, but you're also getting a kickstand case because that MagSafe ring flips out and allows you to prop your phone up in portrait and landscape orientations. The Magic Stand case comes in a bunch of colors to match the finishes of your iPhone. Plus, CaseKu is now accepting Klarna at checkout, which makes things even easier. So definitely check out the link in the description below. And while you're down there, you're not going to want to miss Genius Bar Goes Dark. That is my exclusive one night only event that I'm going to be hosting live in person in San Francisco the day after WWDC. This year's WWDC might feature the next big step of the MacBook Air, a 15 inch one, as well as Apple's mixed reality headset. So this is a big moment and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. We have a venue booked, it costs a lot of money, and I cannot wait to be there with you guys. So check out the link in the description below, get your tickets now. The event is made possible by Clean My Mac X, which I have been using for a really long time, and they're a huge supporter of the channel. I'm so excited. I wish I had more time to talk about it, but I want to get you guys back into that MacBook Air. Okay, so let's back up here and set the stage. It's January of 2008. The iPhone just launched six months ago, and things are going pretty well. Your new operating system, Leopard, a new oh. iMac, lots of new iPods. Oh, the iPhone. I almost forgot the iPhone. Right. Apple is having a bit of a renaissance moment. iPod sales are through the roof and only increasing, and the Mac is entering year two of the Intel transition. This was a perfect time for Apple to shake things up. In a previous video, I talked about the original MacBook Pro, which was basically an Intel modified version of the PowerBook G4. The design is very, very similar. And in fact, the same goes for the plastic MacBook, which replaced the iBook. So Apple really hasn't got any new designs for the MacBook. Enter the MacBook Air. This is during a time where netbooks are going crazy, and Apple thought that they could do it better, especially now that they've got Intel to help them out. So they devised a pretty clever plan. And rather than focusing on miniaturizing a computer, Steve Jobs had a very clear picture. He wanted a full-size 13-inch display, a full-size backlit keyboard, and he wanted a real Core 2 Duo processor. We said we want that chip in this product, but we need to go to smaller packaging. The same die on a smaller package. It sounds easy, it's not. They, they spent a lot of, in, invested a lot of engineering to create this for us. This is the same chip in a package that is 60% smaller. It's iPhone 2.0. This is what happens when the company that just revolutionized the telephone gets a swing at the laptop. Or at least that's what it looks like because under the surface, there are a lot of problems with the MacBook Air. The first problem was the hard drive. Obviously, when you're shrinking a computer to this degree, making it so thin that the MagSafe port is on the underside and you have to make a new MagSafe charger just for this laptop, 
Well, there's gonna be some corners that have to be cut. Apple decided to use the iPod as the source of their drives. That's right, a 4200 RPM hard drive that was only used for playing music is now being expected to run OS X. That's not exactly ideal, but fortunately there is an SSD option for a low, low price of a thousand dollars. Huh. But the hard drive is really just the tip of the iceberg. The other problem is they soldered the RAM on, so there's only two gigs. They used a really, really flimsy heatsink. It's basically a piece of tin foil. And the major problem, that Core 2 Duo that was such a feat of engineering to get in here, well, it doesn't really work all that well because chopping down a CPU and then putting a piece of tin foil over it basically is a recipe for this thing overheating. And that's exactly what it did to the extent that if you actually try to push this machine at all, it overheats and it disables one of the cores. So it, it doesn't even really act like a Core 2 Duo when you need it to. There's also build quality issues. The trackpad button is known to get stuck. The hinges get very loose. I mean, look at mine. This is, this is one of the better ones. They get real, real bad. Honestly, I could go on, but that would be boring because it's, it's a lot. So what Apple did to try to resolve the problem in late 2008 is this. This was the second revision of the MacBook Air and it does solve a lot of the issues. They used a slightly better processor that wasn't as prone to overheating and disabling all of its cores. They also gave this thing the NVIDIA GeForce 9400M chipset graphics that they gave to the MacBook Pro, which was announced in unibody form around the same time. That did make a really big difference because the original MacBook Air was using Intel X1600 GMA, whatever nonsense graphics. It's basically like using the Windows basic display adapter when you don't have your drivers installed all the time. Oh, and they ditched the iPod hard drive, so that made a really big difference. But as much as those improvements helped, there was no real way of getting around the fact that this was an expensive and very flawed machine. It started at $1799, which was just $200 less than a 15 inch MacBook Pro. I've got one right here. This is the late 2008. So these machines were sold alongside each other. Now I've got these both patched and running macOS Catalina, and that gives us a pretty good idea of how well these machines have aged. They both have 128 gigabyte SSDs. They both have Core 2 Duos. This one has four gigs of RAM and this one has two, but I can't really do anything about that. And this comparison really lets you see the difference in longevity for these two machines. For example, I fired up Cinebench R20, and if we speed that up a little bit, you'll notice that while both of these machines are very, very slow by today's standards, the MacBook Air is just absolutely chugging. By the end of my test, I was able to get 266 points out of the 15 inch MacBook Pro, and that cut down to just 120 on the MacBook Air. So as much as Steve Jobs loved to tout the fact that Apple was using a real Core 2 Duo and not some cut down Intel Atom, this was still a very, very major compromise to be making with only a $200 saving. There's a reason why the first generation MacBook Air is pretty rare. It was very flawed, it was very expensive. It was not a practical machine for most people to use. In 2010, Apple completely revamped the MacBook Air with a design that basically stuck around until 2018. And that, that machine absolutely killed it. Apple has made a habit of missing the mark somewhat on their first attempt and then really smashing it on round two. I mean, look at the iPhone, iPad, and Apple Watch just to name a few. And the effects of missing the mark on the first generation MacBook Air are pretty noticeable. I mean, if you try to go and search these things on eBay, they're not that common. Well, these unibody MacBook Pros sold like hotcakes, the MacBook Air was a much tougher sell with those compromises and that price point. So the first generation MacBook Air, as a standalone product, it was not very good. Even later revisions like this are deeply, deeply flawed and they didn't have anywhere near the lifespan that later Macs came to see. But at the end of the day, the MacBook Air was still a revolutionary product. It introduced things like the multi-touch trackpad, the unibody enclosure, and the design language that Apple used for the Mac for years to come. 
But more than that, it introduced the concept of the thin and light laptop. Apple looked at the netbook and they said, that's not it. That's not the future. What people want is a real laptop that's small. And eventually, that's what caught on. Probably 80% or more of the laptops sold today fit into the category that this MacBook Air started. So as much as it is a pretty bad product, I think we're better off for it. Let me know your thoughts on this in the comments below. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.